One afternoon in the summer of 2002, a buddy of mine at the Winston-Salem Journal, state editor Scott Sexton, said, let's go out on the loading dock, let's talk. And he said, what if I told you North Carolina had this program that forcibly sterilized poor black women and girls? I can't tell you more right now, but just go ask some of your best sources, dig around. So I did, I started asking some people. And sure enough, we did have this program, but we didn't have any of the details. I married when I was 18. And when I found out at the age of 19 that I could not give my husband a baby, when I found out that they had did this to me, I mean, I was totally devastated. I, I, I just didn't, I felt so humiliated, so degraded. And in order for me to, I felt like everybody knew what had happened to me. And mind you, I didn't find out that this had happened to me until I was 19 years old. 19 years old when the doctor told me that I had been butchered, butchered? And he explained to me what they had did to me. He told me that they, the doctor had told me that they went inside of me and gutted me open. And that's, that's exactly what he said, and gutted me open like a hog. I mean, and I felt so degraded, so humiliated. I was never, I didn't know, I, I couldn't like myself for one thing. You know, I felt like everybody knew, I felt different than everybody. And I had to go and I had to prove to them that I wasn't feeble-minded. When I saw the papers and what they had said and the reason that they had given that they had sterilized me, I just, I just wanted to just, I don't know. I, it was like, you know, I was living, I was walking around, but I wasn't living. Well, I fought the eugenics for over 40 years, and just recently they decided, uh, 2002, they decided that they did, that they did violate my civil liberties, that they did violate my human rights you know, to procreate. When God put us here, you know, every person have the right and the liberty to have children. God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth in his image. And I said, how can you ever get to see God if you are destroying his image? I was raped at the age of 13 years old. I carried my son for nine months. When they took my son out, they went inside of me, burnt, clipped, and tied my tubes. When they found out that I was pregnant, uh, the social worker coerced my grandmother into uh, having me sterilized. And um, later on, I found out that it was forced sterilization, something that the North Carolina Eugenics Board automatically did to people. Maintaining the image of perfection is a concept humankind has been aspiring to throughout history. The fittest, the smartest, the most attractive have always held a higher place in society than those who fall short of these superficial ideals. Throughout history, we have seen attempts where this drive for perfection has caused discord, violence, and ultimately, mass genocide. Eugenics, meaning well-born, was a term coined in Europe by Sir Francis Galton in 1883. His practices were primarily inspired by The Origin of Species, written by Charles Darwin, his cousin. Following Darwin's theory, Galton promoted the idea of more procreation from the fit and less from the unfit. He stated that if the unfit did not agree to stop procreating, the time may come when such persons would be considered as enemies of the state. Galton also said, what nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly man may do providently, quickly, and kindly. 
Galton's ideas were slow to catch on in Europe, but in the United States, new waves of immigrants sparked fears that the dominant class would soon be outnumbered. American eugenicists decide to resolve this problem through forced sterilization. They condemned procreation from anyone considered unfit, criminals, minorities, the disabled, promiscuous, even the poor. The constitutionality of forced sterilization in America had been overturned several times by the, by the federal courts. And so they're looking for a test case to determine whether or not uh, eugenical sterilization would be held constitutional. The search for a test case to prove feeble-mindedness began with Albert Priddy. His goal was to legitimize a diagnosis of hereditary disease. Priddy was a doctor in the Virginia State Colony for epileptics and the feeble-minded. His practices were already being called into question for forcibly sterilizing women in the local community, subjectively calling them feeble-minded. Carrie Buck, a young woman living in the colony during the search, was selected by Dr. Priddy to be the test subject for the case. Carrie's mother, Emma, who was already a patient at the colony, and her eight-month-old daughter, Vivian, were used to prove that feeble-mindedness was genetic. Carrie Buck became the test subject of the constitutionality. What they're looking for is the hereditary side of eugenics to determine is feeble-mindedness, is epilepsy, is prom promiscuity, etc. is that hereditary? And so there they found Carrie Buck as the test subject whose mother, Emma, and whose daughter, Vivian, were considered to be feeble-minded. And so the Supreme Court in the, in the 1927 case of Buck versus Bell held that three generations of imbeciles are enough. And so Carrie was ultimately sterilized shortly after that case. The courthouse behind me here is the Amherst Circuit Court. This was where the, uh, the, the case really started. It took its footing here. Aubrey Strode was the attorney for the superintendent at that time, Pretty. His name, name was Alfred Pretty, who was the superintendent at that time. He later passed away, and so the next superintendent, John Bell, became the, uh, um, that's where we get the case, Buck versus Bell, who was the um, um, plaintiff in that, in that case. So here, the case took about five hours. Uh, Aubrey Strode called 11 witnesses. Three of them were, uh, uh, were expert witnesses. Um, Joseph DeJarnett, by the way, was one of the witnesses. He was the superintendent at Western State Hospital and a renowned and very adamant eugenicist. Um, and you had um, Pretty was also uh, one of the experts, as well as um, an, an, another expert witness out of the uh, eugenics records office up, up in uh, New York. So they called several witnesses in that case, um, as I said, 11. And I.P. Whitehead, who was the attorney for supposedly Carrie Buck, um, uh, called no witnesses and didn't really challenge the expert witnesses at all. And so the, uh, many of them believe that he colluded with Aubrey Strode to, um, uh, to really, again, test the constitutionality. Actually, if you go to the, the training center in many of those uh, buildings, you'll see I.P. Whitehead as one of the founding members of the, of the building. And yet this is the same attorney who supposedly represented Carrie Buck and, and, her, and uh, uh, her, her well-being. Buck v. Bell opened up the floodgates of forced sterilization in America, providing the legal precedent for the erasure of undesirable populations. Over 30 states enacted sterilization policies. These policies made eugenic thought mainstream practice. American eugenicists finally had the support they needed to fully control the narrative of America's future and what future population would look like. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in his opinion on the court case, It's better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. This was more than a judicial opinion. It was a mindset, a way of thinking that encapsulated progressive America. With the help of influential figures such as John Rockefeller, Dr. J. H. Kellogg, and the Carnegie Institute, research societies such as the Eugenics Record Office and the Race Betterment Foundation were established. In 1910, notable scientist Henry Laughlin became involved with the Record Office. 
He said in his book, Eugenical Sterilization in the United States, Certainly no one from the point of view of constitutional law could make valid legal objection to a sterilization statute enacted for purely eugenical reasons. Social Darwinism really took hold again around the Atlantic, so it's not just a United States phenomenon. Um, there's this idea that one group is better than another. And you've got to keep in mind the science of today. We, we, we think of eugenics and we don't necessarily say that's real science, but the science of that day said that's groups, one group is superior to another. There's certain individuals superior to other individuals. Uh, they were measuring the slope of foreheads to determine uh, intelligence. The, the, the greater the slope, the greater the angle, the less intelligent you were. So the closer you were to 90 degrees, the more intelligent you were. That was the science of the day. And so if you're just an average American or average person and you're reading this and you're hearing this, it made sense. Then that fits into uh, kind of the spirit of the early 20th century, which is this idea that humanity has the capability to make a lot of progress. And it's part of this, what we know in US history is a progressive era, but is this belief we can improve society. The eugenics in many ways was advocating the improvement of society by removing negative or bad traits from the human gene pool. And so that kind of felt, fell into that, that system of progress. Um, whether it was progress or not, it was seen as progress at the time. The value placed on certain traits went beyond science and found its way into a domesticated mindset in the family. State fairs across America began holding genetic contests, first pioneered at the Iowa State Fair's Better Baby Contest in 1911. Contests spread to 40 states before World War I. The first official Fitter Family Contest was held at the Kansas State Fair in 1920. In these contests, records detailing the hereditary traits of participating families were required. Medical doctors performed mind and body exams on family members. Then, family members were given an overall letter grade of eugenic health, and the family with the highest GPA, normally a white family with European heritage, was awarded a silver trophy. The people who were classified as undesirable or unfit were usually Hispanic, African American, or Native American. They didn't fit the Aryan ideal of perfection. Margaret Sanger, was a strong advocate of decreasing the population of minorities. She wove eugenic thought into the rhetoric surrounding women's rights, advocating the depopulation of minorities, particularly in the black communities. You have positive eugenics people who believe that we, we should be controlling the breeding of the population, but through positive means, labeled contraception or sterilization, and sometimes forced sterilization. How that was positive, we do not know, but to the more further extreme of negative eugenics, that included abortion. And Margaret Singen didn't get there in her abortion practices overnight. It started out with contraception. Her first organization, uh, well, her first publication was called the, the Pill, the Birth Control Pill Review. And in that, she encouraged women to get on the pill to be in control of their bodies, to be in control of their destiny. And during that time, that was a form of indecency. So she had to leave the United States uh, under law, and she fled to England, where she met Marie Stopes, who was at the time a paleontologist who was also a eugenist. And t together, um, they worked on their feminist theories that women should be able to control their bodies, women should be able to be a part of controlling the hereditary destiny of the human population. So when Margaret Sager got back, she found out the first birth control clinic in New York, and that first one was in Harlem. And out of that began the Negro Project, which her quoting saying, look, we want to gather as many African-American ministers, businessmen, make sure we have enough African-American faces who are leaders in the African-American community so that they don't realize we're targeting them. Her direct quote is, we don't want the word to get out that we want to extinguish the Negro population. Not only were eugenicists attempting to remove minorities from the gene pool, but they were also advocating for the erasure of the weaker genes amongst their own. Poor whites were targeted, as well as people with disabilities, in an attempt to cleanse the white race of all impurities and weakness. Across the world, this sentiment was imitated in preparation for a more deadly scheme. Reflecting America's strategy, 
The Nazis targeted their citizens for feeble-mindedness, schizophrenia, and epilepsy. Forced sterilizations began in 1934, totaling an estimated 300 to 400,000 victims. More than 200 hereditary health courts were built to determine who should be sterilized. Not only did they want to prevent unfit children from being born, they wanted to regulate the race. The marriage law of 1935 required that all couples show proof that their future children would not be afflicted by hereditary diseases. Buck versus Bell, the decision by the Supreme Court was on May 1927. In 1933 is when the Nazis came into power. And so Hitler, when he was jailed, wrote in Mein Kampf, he really praised the eugenical movement in the United States. Harold A. Laughlin, in fact, spoke a lot to Nazi eugenicists as well and kind of educating them and coaching them on the hereditary defects and of, of uh, uh, feeble-mindedness, etc., as their evidence, if you will, for the uh, justification for uh, sterilization. So when Hitler came into power in 1933, within six months, they enacted eugenical sterilization laws. And in fact, they ramped it up significantly, and they did over 400,000 eugenical sterilizations within the first year. Compare that to about 30,000 in the United States. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler praised American eugenic programs, saying, Today, there is one state in which at least weak beginnings toward a better conception of citizenship are noticeable. Of course, it is not our model, German Republic, but the United States. Joseph DeJarnett, who was again superintendent at the Western State Hospital in Virginia, and he really criticized the Virginia legislature for, for being too slow about their eugenical sterilization practices. In fact, his quote said, the Germans are beating us at our own game. The effects of the Nazis would have been even more devastating with a better understanding of genetics. In terms of the genetic information that's available when we're trying to understand the, the genetic makeup of a child, we actually have access to all the information. Uh, the human genome was sequenced back uh, with the tur turn of the, the millennium, and uh, we've only sequenced the genome multiple times since then. So uh, increasing the accuracy of that. So really, in trying to understand the specific genetics of a child, it really comes down to the question that you're asking. Um, do you want to know what the actual sequence is for a gene that deals with cystic fibrosis? Do you want to know about a specific trait that deals with sickle cell anemia? And when you want to answer those questions, we already know that the answer's there, and we know where to look. It's just to make the action of, of doing the specific procedure to look. That usually just takes a couple cells. So uh, a, a doctor taking some fetal cells from amniotic fluid uh, can be analyzed, and then the question, whatever that is, uh, can be asked um, with an answer given. Usually we're looking for, does the answer, is the DNA sequence within acceptable ranges, so that we can call that normal. Uh, and normal, just as you may be aware, is a relative term. It's based on the population. So, uh, or does it fall into what we call a pathological category where we know that particular sequence is associated with a broken gene and will probably um, result in a child that has some kind of uh, health uh, impairment due to that sequence. Um, what I call curiosities would be what color eyes uh, you know, will this child have, um, color hair, um, and the more and more we learn about how the genome works, we'll have more and more genes that are associated with particular traits. So I imagine our list of curiosities will only increase with the more things we learn about the genome, the height of the child, maybe even things that are a little more vain, like what's the BMI, the body mass index range of this child, um, and even some that might be a little bit more thinking about their future, um, what's the intelligent quotient range uh, for this child. And it's under the guise now of human health, and um, not so much of racism, no, but of who has the better genome, inferior versus superior. That's an old concept, um, and I have a feeling that if we're not careful, especially with government involvement, 
we might find ourselves starting to wander down that trail again. Something ethically to be really aware of as we humbly progress through the, the scientific things that are available. Altogether, the Germans and those who allied with them uh, killed 12 million people, 6 million Jews, and roughly 6 million of others who they saw as less desirables. And so eugenics played out in Germany through sterilization first, which is limiting reproduction, but then actually removal of peoples in the Holocaust. The Nazis were put on trial by the Allies for war crimes. In defense of their actions, the German leaders cited American legal precedents, including documents from Buck versus Bell. America, the same country that began the movement, was now condemning another country for adopting the same mentality. After the horrors of the Holocaust were revealed to the world, the once clamorous eugenics movement in America receded to a whisper. It was recoding itself, preparing to take a new form. Now, during World War II, you know, toward the end, as the camps were liberated, and people realized, and it all came out, and people realized what Hitler had done. A lot of those GIs came home, and you know, there was a whole climate and culture of, this can't happen here. So that led to a lot of states backing off. Most states backed off of their programs, for sterilization programs, but not North Carolina. No, North Carolina ramped its program up. North Carolina had at least gone, it's the, the, the people it was sterilizing as far as the racial breakdown in the beginning was proportionate to the general population. But in the 1960s, North Carolina decides to just target poor black women and girls like no other state had ever done. In the 1960s, eugenics programs not only ramped up in several states, including North Carolina, but also in U.S. territories like Puerto Rico. By 1965, over one-third of women in Puerto Rico had been sterilized. Only one-third of them understood that the surgery was irreversible. So the eugenical sterilization practice is not about the sterilization itself, but it's about this idea that we could kill off people simply because of who they are. So the, so the idea of eugenics means well-born. It's this idea that we don't want people with feeble-mindedness or hereditary defects uh, to be in our society. It's because they sap the benefits, the, the finances of, uh, of, of, of our society, right? When people are on welfare, it's basically a welfare reduction uh, type of program. The government had an interest in reducing that cost by forcibly sterilizing folks. The eugenics movement is definitely playing out in history today, especially with minority communities and with the socioeconomic classes, particularly those who are of low socioeconomic classes. You'll see the majority of these abortion clinics or contraception slash sexual education programs targeting lower class Americans and Hispanic and black Americans. And when you ask, well, why are you doing that? They'll say, well, we're just targeting the communities that are the most neediest, but yet they have no answer for how they define neediest. So it is a philosophy that is completely ingrained even into the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973, which legalized abortion here in the US. The leading justice on the Roe versus Wade case, he cited several eugenics sources in his decision. So, I mean, this is something that, um, the eugenics philosophy, it attracts the elitists of, uh, of, of our country, and it's something that is being poured into with a lot of wealth. You have the Rockefellers, you have the Carnegie Foundation, you have um, uh, Dr. Clarence Gamble, who is the leading founder of the Procter & Gamble Corporation. All of these people were funding research into contraception, into population control, and how they could breed the best of the best of the society. There is a feministic mindset that comes to the eugenics movement, uh, and that is partly in, in due to Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and Marie Stopes, founder of Marie Stopes International. Now, Marie Stopes International is a contraception abortion uh, organization that particularly targets countries overseas. Uh, 
mostly undeveloped countries. Their key slogan is children by choice, not by chance. And they are the leading sponsor of humanitarian aid for the U.S. And the crazy thing about it is that as a country, it's, it's us, the U.S., France, and Canada, where we are primarily the, the largest givers of humanitarian aid to undeveloped countries. But we're giving that humanitarian aid along with Marie Stopes, who is a part of the UN, uh, who helps fund health priorities. We only give this humanitarian aid to these countries if they agree to accept contraception and sexual education and how to have safe abortions. I feel personally offended and personally affected by the eugenics movement and how it's playing out today in the efforts of contraception and abortion because it is specifically targeting minority communities, people who look like me. So when they say, let's, um, let's make sure that we keep abortion legal, let's make sure we keep abortion safe and legal and not take away the rights that belong to these poor communities, especially women of color. Politicians and campaigners and people with a lot of money who are funding these efforts, they say these things. And it's highly offensive because when you look at the numbers today, the African American population only makes up 13% of the American population, but yet we get 36% of all the abortions. We've been in this country since the 1600s, and yet we're still only at 13%. That's a problem. We should be concerned about that. They were not sterilizing black people until the latter part of the 60s. Prior to that, it was uh, the poor white people that they were sterilizing, but then it declined and it escalated in the latter part of the 60s with black people. Um, they was used doing sterilization. Black people had not did not know anything about abortion, uh, which is a part form of depopulating a particular group of people. So what happened was Margaret Singer went into the churches and she um, paid the preachers and all to go out into the neighborhoods and to uh, sell abortions to the black community, okay, which was wrong. And um, so what we have now is uh, black women which had no clue about abortion killing off of their babies. I mean, it, it, is, it is sickening to know that we have killed millions of black babies and lynched them in the womb. While eugenics can result in the deletion of unwanted communities, it can also occur on a microscopic scale by attempting to edit our own DNA. Previous science focused on birthing better babies. The questions we wrestle with today center on designing better humans. So when, when thinking about the development of desirable or allowing undesirable traits uh, to exist in the population, we think about what things we would allow in our children or what things we want in our children. Uh, let's talk first about the, the issues of human health. Human health already is a sliding scale of normalcy. Um, we define disease as being something that medically is significantly different than what we consider normal. Um, that's usually widely accepted, but of course when you start thinking about editing the genome and having a justification for, for this and writing up the lawyer speak for what says, oh, this is something that I can change, or I think you're going to get into kind of a slippery slope of gray area based on how you define what is normal. Somewhere in there, I think you're going to have to talk about the philosophical statement of what is the purpose of reproduction, uh, what makes a person a person, and what is our role, what, what is our mandate and responsibility to future generations because we're making these decisions, presumably, for their benefit. So I think those things would need to be defined. In terms of fads, that's always going to be changing. So it, it's tough to predict where that would go. Um, I would hope that the technology, the price, uh, would keep people from venturing into such what I'll call frivolous um, exercises, which personally I think could only be damning for the future worth of, of, of children and of the population. It's one thing to say, I made you. 
<laughs> and and we, we have an ownership with our children, right? Because we know that our, our genes are in there. And I have some nurturing and parental responsibility. And there's evidence of that, mm -hmm. that you wear. That's why we look at children and they can honor their parents. It's a whole different connotation if you have the I made you, like I own you, I created you. Mm -hmm. um, that has an ownership value to it, uh, which I think goes beyond what is a healthy relationship between uh, parents and their offspring. Between 80 and 90 percent of, of children diagnosed with Down syndrome in the womb are terminated before they're even born simply because of who they are. So although we got rid of the term eugenics with this idea of, of, of well-born, there's a negative connotation to it after the Nazis, but it's still present with us today, right? Now, instead of sterilizing, the reason why we sterilized is because you couldn't tell what kind of child it was. Uh, one was having, right? You didn't know if it was going to have Down syndrome or feeble-mindedness or what have you. But with today's technology, DNA gives us a picture of what the child is going to be before they enter into the world, right? And so it's still that idea. So the reason why we don't sterilize today is because we can kill or terminate the child in the womb. So in thinking about the concept of designer children, uh, whether you're changing a child according to your own wishes or whether you're trying to change the genetic makeup of a child for their own benefit in terms of maybe a medical issue that's well known in a family. Um, I, I think you run into several possible conflicts um, in how that's regulated and, and, and doled out. First off, it's going to cost money. So this is going to be an option that's probably only going to be available to the extremely rich. And that may cause a stigma between social economic status, but it may not. Um, some people may like the fact that their children aren't designer children and that they're the way, quote, God made them, um, end quote. And, and that, of course, we've seen that in other, uh, you know, the purest idea that's played, played a role even in modern medicine. Some people don't even take medicine while others do. So that same kind of concept, I think, is going to continue to play out uh, in that genre. I think another concept that comes out of how this might result is what's the limit to which this will be regulated? Um, how, how far will we go in designing and fixing children? Um, I've always been a little slow to want to change things because it requires information. And when you change a cell, then that cell is going to make an entire human. Um, you, you better know what that change is going to do. The genes in our genome are not isolated events. They're not an island of information unto themselves. They are part of gene regulatory networks. Changing one gene changes many other things. Um, so because of that, I worry that if we too cavalierly move into changing the human genome for the sake of the child without proper information, we may find that down the road, um, we've caused some harm, even though our intentions were great. But that's what time will have to tell. In terms of genetics, though, designer children would be changing things that we might look at as being inferior to something that is more beneficial. Um, I, I usually stay away from the vain uh, aspect of that of, I drew a picture of a child we're going to have this child, which that would also be a designer child. I don't, I don't think we're near that, that range uh, yet in terms of, um, one, technology, what we can do, but two, the ethics and legality of that. I don't think we're close to that yet. There's actually um, many rules on the genetics that you can do with animals. Uh, so there's actually some very strict uh, rules and laws about how much can we change um, a primate's genome because scientists are thinking, if we change it too much, is it still a primate? I think that same kind of connotation goes in with, with human health, of how much of this can we change, how much of it should we change? Eugenics is more than a footnote in history, the backbone of the Nazi movement, or a modern pseudoscience. It's a mindset dictating that burdens must be eliminated, that inconveniences are not worth the effort, that life is not inherently valuable. Eugenics undermines the very foundation of human dignity. 
it says that one person is innately more valuable than another. The eugenic movement isn't over. It's simply recoded itself and has been slowly reintroduced to society in new forms. You think beyond what happened to them physically, what about all of humanity being ripped off? I mean, one of these babies that couldn't be born could have had the cure for cancer, could have been a great president, or maybe just taken the keys away from a drunk driver before he slammed into a van and killed a family. What can be done to solve this problem is that people need to become aware of what is actually going on and how they can do that is watching films like this and sharing it with other people. Don't keep this knowledge to yourself. And secondly, you know, the, the truth that we all have um, as a majority of Americans right now, we're seeing the most pro-life generation we've ever seen. And that is rooted in the, in the morality and truth that every human being has inherent dignity, worth, and value. And that is um, something that we need to take to the voting booth. It is extremely important to examine the candidates that you're going to be voting for who are pro-life. A lot of people who are chanting maybe at the Women's March or at other rallies, you know, my body, my choice, this is a marketing tool, this is a marketing slogan that many people do not understand has an inherent built-in philosophy in it to eugenics, and they don't know that. So it's very, very important to make being pro-life a central component to your voting habits and to see which candidates are really going to uphold the inherency and dignity of every human being. The idea of eugenics, again, it's not about, that, uh, it's not about sterilization in, of, uh, in and of itself. Sterilization is the means to the end is killing off that person, ensuring that there is no posterity in the future, right? And so that's what we're doing uh, with, with today using DNA and technology uh, such as a, a abortion and scans and so on and so forth. And that's my concern again, is what are we doing with that information? We shouldn't be forcibly sterilizing people in the name of trying to develop a master human race. But yet, sometimes we do it on a micro level just with our own families. To determine who and who is not fit to live in our society is not within us to go ahead and decide that. We get it wrong. History shows we get this wrong all the time. Nazis got it wrong. They did it in the name of not just a hatred toward J J Jews, but there was a lot of folks, homosexuals, and people who were considered feeble-mindedness. And so what they do with them? They took it to its logical conclusion. If these people are, quote, defectives, then we move from sterilizing to euthanasia. And that's what happened first, is these colonies of where people with disabilities lived in, they started in the name of mercy, started killing them systematically. Once you go down that road, then it's just, let's keep on keeping our foot down to the pedal, the pedal to the metal and start ensuring that we do this with more people in, in order to develop a, a master race or a superhuman race.